Earth Day, Part 2. Water is more important. With Sandra Postel, Director of the Global Water Policy Project. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now, in the second part of this two-part Earth Day episode, water is more important. We're exploring the vital roles that water plays in sustaining life on Earth and beyond. Our special guest is none other than Sandra Costell, director of the Global Water Policy Project. She'll share her insights with us into the importance of this precious resource. So, I'm sitting here on my bachelor pad, and you have me wondering, how did it all get here? The water, I mean. It seems Earth has an awful lot of it. I mean, Blue Planet, and all that rot. Well, it turns out no one is quite sure how or why water formed in such great quantities on Earth. Now, certainly being at the right distance from the sun and having a thick atmosphere or allowing water to cool on its surface certainly helps. But, how did water first arise on our world? Now, researchers have been puzzling over this question for a few years, and there are a few major ideas which have emerged. Uh, one theory is that uh, water arrived on Earth through comets and asteroids. These space-borne clumps of rock and ice collided with our planet in great numbers billions of years ago, potentially bringing water with them. Early Earth will never make it through this heavy bombardment. Uh, this theory is supported by the fact that the ratio of heavy to what regular water on Earth is very similar to that found in comets, suggesting the snowballs in space may have played a major role in forming the oceans of Earth. Another possibility is that water was present on Earth from the very beginning during the formation of our planet. Now, this theory suggests that water was present in the gas and dust cloud that eventually coalesced to form our planet. Now, as Earth cooled and solidified, the water vapor condensed into liquid, forming oceans. Eh, cool water. Totally. Uh, the third theory is that water was created by the reactions that took place within the Earth's mantle. Uh, this idea suggests that uh, high pressures and temperatures within the mantle caused the formation of water molecules from the elements present from the layers of our nascent planet. Also, it is possible that each of these sources played some role in creating the aquatic environment of our water world. Now today, water covers more than 70% of our planet, supporting millions of species of life. And water around the planet, together with the life which depends on it, are threatened by global climate change, <coughs> driven by human activity. <coughs> Next up, we're going to talk with Sandra Postel, Director of the Global Water Policy Project. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Sandra Postel. She is director of the Global Water Policy Project, and she's recently written the foreword to this new book from Nat Geo Kids, Water, 
why every drop counts and how you should start making waves to protect it. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. So could tell us a little bit about how you first became interested in science, conservation, and water. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a great question. I, you know, I think it goes back to when I was about, you know, a young person, um, certainly by age 15. I just felt a really strong sense that I was here on this planet to do something on behalf of the earth. And um, it felt like a great sense of purpose that I got early on. And water became sort of my fascination and passion, really. Um, <clears throat> I had opportunities in, you know, in school to study water. And my first job out of school was around water. And I just sort of got hooked and never quite left. So it's been a long, a long journey and a really fun, good one, too. Mm. Did you grow up around the water, like at the ocean side or lake? Or I actually did. I grew up on Long Island oh. uh, in New York. So I spent many, many days at the beach. So in some ways, it might have made sense to be an ocean conservationist more than freshwater. But at the same time, I learned, you know, the importance of freshwater living, you know, around the sea and relying on groundwater beneath our feet for our drinking water. So, um, yeah, it was it was a great start to uh, appreciating all the nature around us. That is fabulous. So, you know, over your career, you must have learned so many incredible things about water. But what do you think are some of the general public's biggest misconceptions about water? Biggest misconceptions. I think one <clears throat> is that water is just always going to be there, right? It rains, it snows, but the fact is it's all finite. You know, we look at this blue planet, this beautiful blue planet, and most of that water, 90, you know, 99% of it is not water we can drink or use to grow crops. And the vast majority of it is the water that is behind you, is the ocean. And less than 1% of all that blue on the planet is water that is fresh and accessible to us. And it's finite, right? right. So we've had growing population. We've had growing you know, use of water, growing demand for water against that finite supply. So that's really kind of the challenge is to make sure that we you know, stay within the limits of water and, and make sure it's there for, for future generations. Mm. And it's funny because I think that a lot of people, when they think of water, tend to think of, oh, how am I going to, what, you know, what am I going to use to drink and cook and wash my, wash my clothes with? But there's a whole lot of, we use up a whole lot of, a whole lot more water than we might think, don't we? We very much do. <clears throat> and this is a big, a big aha for a lot of people. Um, you know, that if you add up the numbers, it takes about 2,000 gallons of water a day to sustain the average American's lifestyle. And half of that is in our diet. And then maybe a third is in our energy. And then all the things we see in our room, our computer, our phone, our clothes. And then the last five or 10% is the water that we use at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our footprint, our water footprint, the water that we're using every day for our, our lifestyle is a lot more than just the water that's coming out of the tap. You know, and if, just to give a couple quick numbers to kind of <clears throat> give a sense of this, you know, if we're wearing a cotton shirt, that can take 700 gallons of water to make that one cotton shirt. And most yeah. of that water, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Most of that water is is used to grow the cotton out in the field, right? If we're having like a cheese pizza for lunch, that cheese pizza can take 330 gallons of water to make. Again, that growing the hay to feed the cow to make the milk and, and make the cheese. So there's a lot of water that goes into our lifestyle. And I don't want to make people feel guilty about that. It takes a lot of water to grow crops and so on. But what I hope people can see is that there are a lot of things we can do to shrink that footprint, but still be very happy, very healthy, very productive in our lives, right? 
And that's where I think education around water can, can really empower us to be more mindful of, of um, our own water footprint and how we can shrink it. And that may be a new term for some people, water footprint. We've all heard of our carbon footprint, for instance. But what can ordinary people do to help become more aware of and to reduce their water footprint? Yeah, well, a great place to start is the book we're talking about. Um, there's a really good information in there about what our water footprint is and what it consists of. Um, and I think it's a great sort of place to dive in because it starts right here. You know, I think we're accustomed to thinking, well, the engineers are managing the water for us and they do a great job by and large, but we can also do a lot starting with understanding our personal use of water. And I think the water footprint is a way that, that makes that a very sort of intimate personal look at our own use of water and how we can shrink it. Um, and of course, at home, there's also a variety of things we can do with our families. How are we using water outdoors? Do we really need to water that green lawn? You know, can we put in native plants instead that might be good for the birds and the bees? Um, can we fix the leaks in our home, put more efficient appliances in? You know, there's a lot of just things around the home we could talk to our parents and our siblings and our families about doing. Um, so I think there's a, a great way to start there and then kind of build out from there into our community. I think a terrific way to get going is to understand our source of water. Now you mentioned I grew up on Long Island and water came out of the tap and it took me a while to understand that the water was coming from beneath our land, right? It was groundwater. I couldn't see it. And that made me aware that everything we do on the land is also affecting the water that we're drinking because it's right beneath so we want to make sure we don't contaminate the land so, so that it keeps the water clean and healthy. So all those things and understanding where that water is coming into your home is coming from is important. Absolutely. And um, I've read something fascinating in your forward, which was, and correct me if I'm wrong about the numbers here, but since 1970, the number of freshwater vertebrates has decreased to 76%. Something That's close. It's actually, unfortunately, a little more than that. Uh, uh. It's increased. Uh, it, it's kind of an index, right? Like we literally can't go out and count all the fish and all the frogs. Right. But looking at an index of, of this, it, the estimates are that we have seen a decline in fish and frogs and other freshwater vertebrates of 86% in the last 50 years. So that's, that's kind of mind blowing. I mean, it means, you know, you can think of it almost as for every hundred fish and frogs that were around 50 years ago, there are now only 14, right? And that's, that's very sad to me. That's very sad to me. But, you know, part of what I think we can do is start to restore the habitats start to bring species back. I mean, one of the things that I have found very, you know, sort of hopeful in this somewhat difficult picture sometimes is that we've begun to remove dams from rivers and streams that we no longer need, where, where the dams are no longer serving the purpose they were built for. And that's opened up many, many miles of river to flow freely again. And what we have seen time and again is when we can remove a dam, that again, that we no longer need, we see fish populations rebound really, really well, whether it's you know salmon or shad or what have you, they come back. And that's a very hopeful thing that if we can restore habitat, the, the, the life will come back. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, but we have to do a lot more of it because we're still losing these 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 animal populations, right? The fish and the frogs and so on. Yeah. And as I understand, even for the dams that you still want to keep around, there are better ways of designing them. And there are ways of modifying ones that are there to be better for wildlife and for water conservation. Is that absolutely yeah. absolutely. We've been putting in fish ladders for those fish that can, you know, get up a ladder on the side of a dam and get to the other side to get to their upstream habitat. 
Switch ladders can sometimes work. They don't always work, but that's one solution. Another one is to think about how the dam could be managed to sort of mimic the way the river flowed before the dam was there. Hmm. So if you think about the snow melt in the springtime, that's usually a big pulse of water that downstream species have relied on for millennia sometimes for their cue to go and spawn. And if we can give them that cue again by releasing some water through the dam, it might allow them to head upstream to spawn. So we can we can try to do those kinds of things as well to give the life in rivers a bit more of a chance to survive. And um, of course, one of the great things we have to all be aware of in in our times uh, is global warming and global climate change. Can you tell us about some of the effects that uh, global warming has had uh, on our, especially our oceans, but other waterways as well? Yeah, if you think about global warming, the basic physics of it, if you will, is that we're warming the atmosphere <clears throat> through you know, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and so on. And as the atmosphere warms, it expands. And that means it can hold more water. So what that does is it increases evaporation from the drier areas, and it increases the intensity of rainfall in the wetter areas. So in a way, dry areas are getting drier, wet areas are getting wetter. And we've seen this, right? Flooding is getting more severe and droughts are getting more severe. So global warming is, is very much affecting the water cycle. And if and I were to say, I think most of us have already experienced this in one form or another, that the way we are experiencing climate change, which can kind of seem a little abstract, right. the way we're experiencing climate change is largely through this water cycle, more intensity of droughts, wildfires, more intensity of floods, and that kind of thing. And so in order to really have more security of water in the future, we're gonna to have to face the climate impacts, right? And build more resilience into the into the picture and slow that rate of climate change down. You know, we're beginning to get a hint of where the future is if we don't tamp it back. And we're starting to, but wow, it's way, way too little given the scale of the challenge, right? We've really got to scale it up, ramp it up and make this an all hands on deck moment. We've seen, we've gotten glimmers of what's gonna happen if we don't face the music here. And I think we need to really all join into this into this challenge. And finally, you know, the whole thing with trying to save save water, save the oceans to help protect water, to help combat climate change can seem overwhelming. You know, it can feel like you're tilting at windmills. So <laughs> uh, I do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so what can you tell people who feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do. I may as well just, you know, live the nihilistic life and, you know, <laughs> go about what I'm doing. How, how can people keep, keep hope? You know, I ask myself that a lot and it's challenging it, in this, in this time, it's, it's challenging to, to feel hopeful. And I'm, I'm a believer in honest hope. I mean, hope is a very nebulous concept and it has to be grounded to me in some realistic way. And, and the way I, I take um, some, find some hope, some honest hope, looking at <clears throat> ways in which farmers and cities and communities and individuals are, are leading productive, healthy lives, but using less water in the process and returning some water to nature. Those are the two things we need to do. Shrink our footprint as a society, our water footprint, return some water to the natural world in a way that's going to keep life going. We're all connected in this web of life. And so I think those are the two things we need to do. And if we participate in those, and enough of us participate in those two things, we can start to turn some of this around. It'll feel like turning the Titanic around, right? And, and avoiding the iceberg. I think about that sometimes. But we, we can do our part to make that happen. And if thousands and you know, first hundreds and then thousands and then millions of us 
shrink our footprint, start returning some water to nature, the one thing we know is nature is resilient. If we give it water, there can be a bounce back. Hmm. And so I think that's where I get my honest hope that we've seen that happen. We're not doing enough of it, but if we can all get involved, scale it up, nature will come back. We've seen that happen. So that's where I get my honest hope. That's awesome. And I love that term, honest hope. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Sandra. It was fabulous talking with you. Thank you, James. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your time as well. And that was Sandra Postel, uh, director of the Global Water Policy Project. She's recently written a foreword to this new book from Nat Geo Kids, Water. Check it out for yourself, your kids, the neighbors, whatever. Now, the blue marble on which we live is more than just oceans, lakes, ponds, and rivers. Water's also found in the atmosphere, aquifers, and life itself, including you and me. Now, heat from the sun drives evaporation from water, uh, from oceans and other bodies, water lifting water into the air. Now, this water vapor eventually condenses in the clouds and then releases moisture as precipitation, such as rain and snow, back onto the land and the water. Now, moisture which falls onto land can either seep into the ground and become groundwater or flow back into rivers, lakes, and oceans, restarting the cycle. This process is also influenced by factors like wind, temperature, and topography, which help determine the amount of precipitation that falls in different areas. Now, this water cycle uh, also ensures that water is constantly moving and being redistributed around our planet, providing us with this essential resource that we all need to survive. Some desert plants only need water once every couple weeks under most conditions. Those ever resilient tardigrades can last decades between drinks of water. And, some bacteria also use very little water, although their metabolism still depends on this vital liquid. The rest of us really need this stuff. There are several ways people can help conserve and protect this precious resource. Homeowners can seek out efficient appliances with the water sense label and repair water leaks as soon as they're possible, as soon as possible after they're discovered. Rainwater harvesting collects water which would have simply rolled off roofs, making it accessible for gardens and outdoor cleaning. Water in gardens during mornings and evenings reduces evaporation and water use. Shorter showers can also play a role in conserving water. Nay, Wilbur. Every little bit helps when we look to preserve the health of life forms on Earth. Even on other worlds, water may be an ideal substance for extraterrestrial life in which to evolve and develop. Pretty cool, huh? Water is more important, not much. And I'm Poseidon, so I'm right. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're going to be pondering panspermia. The idea that life here on Earth may have started from ingredients from space delivered by comics and asteroids. We're going to be talking with Brian Selznick, author of Big Tree. Make sure to join us starting on the 29th of April at the thecosmiccompanion.net. Sign up for our newsletter newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com and never miss an episode. Probably. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cosmic Companion, please tell your friends about the show. Sign up, comment, share, you know the speed. Clear skies.